course. channel. Uh, been having a good time today so far. Woke up nice and early. Went to the gym. Actually just got back from the gym here a little bit ago. Uh, cleaned up from that. Uh, got some coffee. Heard I'd give you guys some information. All right. There's a few things I want to talk about today. All right. But before we get too deep into things, I just want to say the best way to support the channel just hit the like button, subscribe, toggle that notification bell, leave a comment, kind of helps the algorithm out. Obviously, if you want to go a little further, down in the description below is the merch store where we have awesome merch, new designs all the time. And of course, the weather is getting cooler, and a lot of the designs have sweatshirt options, along with you know coffee mugs, things like that. That being said, the holiday season is coming up. And that will make some really great presents for some people out there. So stop into the merch store, grab yourself some merch. Of course, we have Patreon, Locals, and all that stuff. You can also become a member on YouTube here, where you can get some exclusive content. Now, coming up in an, uh, about a week or so, uh, I'm trying to decide if I'm going to do a live or um, just... And upload. Obviously, members will have special content, but I am coming up on my one-year anniversary of rage quitting, and I'm really going to dive into that because, well, I'll explain more in that video. So let me know what you think. Should I do a live Halloween night, or should I just do the standard upload video thing that I normally do? Okay, now let's get into it. Don't want to waste it. Okay. So I'm going to give you guys a quick update on Grant V. Lamont. So I know the last video you guys uh, heard that they were doing oral arguments on that day. And uh, Connecticut Inside Investigator actually had an article about the state's attorney and what they had said. Uh, Eddie also had uh, graciously sent me the transcript of the arguments between um, the attorneys for the CCDL and Eddie and all the other plaintiffs. And of course, you can see how the state argued and all that stuff. Um, if you don't know what the CCDL is, just gathering my thoughts here. Um, I don't know if you're living under a rock or, or not. The CCDL is a citizen's defense. Uh, the Connecticut Citizens Defense League. It is absolutely free to join. It's running something like 43,000 members in the state of Connecticut currently. And when the legislative body and the governor try to push unconstitutional gun control, which they do get away with a lot, but who helps combat this? Who sues the government to help get all this undone through the courts. Well, that's simple. That's the CCDL. The NRA, the FPC, the GOA, and I can just keep going on and on and on, really don't have too much of a footprint in the state of Connecticut or that all of New England, especially the NRA. They are just dead silent on things. Um, they've come out in the past in favor of gun control and said, well, you know, bump, st bump stocks are kind of stupid. It's okay to ban them. No. I think they're stupid too, but they should be completely legal because it's just a piece of plastic. It doesn't do anything to change the firearm. The functions stay the same. All right? And the courts rule the same way. So bump stocks are back on the table. I mean, they're still illegal in the state of Connecticut, but the, the courts come out and so said the uh, ATF can't just arbitrarily ban them because they don't like them. Okay? So I implore all of you, go and join the CCDL. I will include a link in the description below uh, for this article, and of course, a link to join the CCDL. So if you're not a member already, 
join. Every now and then, if you go to their meetings, you may see me there, me and the Mrs. Guru, bebop in, hang out for a little while. It's a good way to catch up on what's going on outside of the, the normal stuff. Um, you know, the legal funds and all that stuff when they do all that. But when they bring in guests to speak and all that good stuff. Um, good information. Especially now, it's election season, which we're going to be getting into the CCDL's grading system. I'll explain that later. Let's get to this article first. I have wasted enough of your time. Okay. So this article is titled, State's Attorney, Hunting Rifles Are Not Constitutionally Protected in Connecticut. All right, so I'm pretty much just going to read this article to you. Hunters take note. State's attorneys are arguing our rifles are not constitutionally protected in Connecticut. What does this mean? According to attorney Joshua Perry, who works for the Connecticut Attorney General's Office, this means hunting rifles are illegal but not protected by the Constitution. He argues that the Constitution only guarantees citizens to right to guns commonly used in self-defense and that semi-automatic rifles used in hunting do not fall into that category. I think he's alluding to the AR-15, which... Honestly, it's illegal to hunt in the state of Connecticut with a 5.56223 or like an AR-15. Um, but Texas and a lot of other states, when you're going out getting rid of boars and yotes, that's the preferred rifle. All right. This discussion came up on Wednesday in the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Attorneys representing Governor Ned Lamont and the National Association for Gun Rights, NAGR, made oral arguments in front of Judge Allison Nathan. Uh, this was part of a lawsuit that Nagger filed against the state last year. Nagger and the co-paint of Tony Teresa Spira are challenging the Act Concerning Gun Violence Prevention and Child Safety. The Act, which was passed after the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, bans the sale of firearms and accessories classified as assault weapons. Nagar and Spira believe it violates the Second Amendment rights. Perry argued the state could restrict guns not commonly used for self-defense. Let's stop right there. The AR-15 is America's rifle. It is used for self-defense, for sporting, for entertainment purposes, which I'm sure you've heard in the news. Um, it is used for a lot of things, okay? When it comes to self-defense, walking around in the streets, yes, everyone just carries their handgun concealed, and that becomes a primary. But when we're talking about protecting one's home, if you still think a handgun would be a great primary, you're wrong. A handgun becomes the secondary. That is to get to your primary. And no, a shotgun is, is not the primary. A shotgun is tertiary. A carving, a solid working semi-automatic rifle chambered in 556 or 223 is the ideal firearm for home defense. All right. Perry argues that the state could restrict guns not commonly used for self-defense. Again, that is America's gun. There are so many out there. It's hard to keep track of. You just can't count. So they are in common use. There you go. <clears throat> Nathan asked if, by this logic, semi-automatic hunting rifles were protected. Perry said they are not. Connecticut restricts instrumentalities that are usually dangerous, that are like the M16 rifle, that have combat function features. I don't know what that is. Maybe you can explain it to me. That allows the user to hose down a battlefield or tragically a school and cause uh, a disproportionate number of casualties, Perry said. They're tugging at the heartstrings, guys. He referenced the bans on M16s in 08. The Supreme Court upheld the ban on the weapon in Columbia v. Heller. They did not uphold it. They didn't even address it. Hence, why you have the Illinois lawsuits, the Maryland lawsuit right now, 
that is before the Supreme Court, but the Illinois ones are still going through the courts. The Supreme Court goes back to Illinois and said, no, 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 no. You need to use Bruin and Heller and all these other cases we've already ruled on because you got it wrong. You need to get it back in line with the rulings we've already made. And the Supreme Court didn't want to jump in and dip their toes into the waters because there wasn't a final um, decision made on Illinois yet. However, Maryland got a final decision because of the the, the three-panel en banc panel just took it away from all the other judges and said, we're going to make a ruling on it. And they're like, yep, we're ruling that it. it's constitutional. You can ban these guns. Boom. Final judgment. Now it gets to go to the Supreme Court. So hopefully they can get before the Supreme Court before the first of the year. The problem is Maryland asked for an extension. It was granted uh, for 30 days. And then they came back and asked for another extension for 30 days. This time, though, the Supreme Court said, no, get your crap together, we're going, which we discussed in another video. Perry argues that the plain text is historically understood of the U.S. Constitution that protects the right to self-defense, not a right to possess any type of weapon for any sort of confrontation. I call BS. It says the right of the people to bear arms shall not be infringed. Okay, what are bearable arms? Anything and everything. That, that's just, it, it's plain text. You can't screw this one up. S stop trying to interpret things that are just simple, you know? You know, you've heard in the past, we're like, well, you can't own cannons. It literally took me a 10-second Google search to find a company in Texas that makes everything from the tiny little cannons to full-size cannons. You can buy them, they'll ship them to you. They are rather expensive because of shipping and they're heavy. But fully functional cannons. They even had this in the Federalist Papers. They asked specifically, hey, does the Second Amendment cover cannons? And Madison came back and said, of course it does. That's why you had merchant ships outfitted with tons of cannons sitting off the coast of New York back in the late 1700s because those cannons were used for self-defense. So when any politician comes out and says you can't own a cannon, they're lying to you. They don't know what they're talking about. Let me get back to the article. Immediately after these arguments, another gun case was argued. Grant Jr., so this is the Grant v. Um, Lamont, was presented during these arguments as well. Connecticut has not banned hunting rifles. Whether or not they are constitutionally protected, they are certainly democratically protected. Very said. As a rule, something is popular, it doesn't need to be constitutionally protected. Because it's popular, hunting rifles would certainly fall into that category. No, it needs to be. It needs to be protected. Because you guys are always trying to take stuff away. My First Amendment right to free speech is constitutionally protected. I literally can stand in a movie theater and scream fire. The Supreme Court ruled that is okay. Now, I wouldn't say to do that because it's going to cause panic, people are going to get hurt, and it is a call to action. And if it was false, well, you could be hemmed up because you're you know, getting people hurt. However, you can. That is not a thing where you can't scream fire in a theater. No, you're able to. I'm sorry, but you are, all right? When it comes to hunting rifles, yeah, they're popular today. You don't want to take them away. You don't want to ban them until you do. That's why they're protected, okay? They're doing it with the free speech stuff right now. X, I'm not going to dead name them, Twitter, but X is like the free speech social platform. It used to tout themselves as, oh, we're free speech. They weren't. I mean, and then Elon buys it and brings everything to light. And then you know damn well that the government had their fingers in it. They had spooks in the offices, and they were crushing any narrative that didn't fit what the government wanted. Now it's opened up. Everybody gets a voice in the whole thing. Free speech is back. And what do we hear from all these talking heads? We need to investigate Elon Musk. We need to curb that because it's dangerous. Misinformation. 
this information and all that stuff. That wasn't a thing until 2016. I agree. People say some dumb shit. And if you believe them, that's on you. Do your own research. Double, triple check the things they say. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. All right? I just think it's funny because they gave Alex Jones such a ton of crap when he was talking about the frogs being gay and all that. Turns out, he was right. The chemicals were screwing the frogs up, but neither here nor there. I just think it's funny. And what are they doing to him? Uh, They're destroying his platform for free speech. His free speech. They'll never make him go away. He just needs a camera. That's all he needs. His, His smartphone. He just picks up his iPhone, goes live. Goes on a rant for a couple hours. They're never going to be able to stop them. They can try. Never going to happen. He went on to say, as to whether Connecticut could restrict hunting rifles. I think we probably could not. Because I think it would be shown that they are not unusually dangerous. They are not ill disproportionately suited in that way. Arrow 15s are... And the record might uh, as well show that they are used and useful for self-defense. I'll be honest. We have not done that analysis. And we have no reason to think that it wouldn't be true. Okay, so here's the thing. They're always going to lie and say that 5.56 is such a horrifying round. It's it's devastating. It's deadly. Blah, blah, blah. Here's the thing. Um, It's a 22. That's all it is. It's a 22. A hunting round. 30-30, 30-06, 30-30, 30-06, 3-08, um, 300 Win Mag. All these other hunting rounds by far are massive compared to a 5.56. They have no idea what they're talking about. Some automatic shotguns are used for hunting pheasants, waterfowl, and uh, partridge, according to UG online. I'm going to try your last name, my guy. The treasurer of the Northwest Connecticut Rod and Gun Club, who spoke with Inside Investigator about hunting and ownership of guns throughout Connecticut. Eugene, who owns a semi-automatic shotgun to hunt pheasants, believes gun regulations in Connecticut are way too strict and expect them to get even stricter in the immediate future. Of course, Lamont's already said they're coming for more stuff. If you don't remember when they passed HB 667, it was way bigger than what actually got signed into the law. And he said, well, next year we're going to try and get the rest of it. So we need people like Fishbein, Cooley, and a few others to stand up for our rights. We have a constitutional right to own and use firearms. They're not talking about banning any particular type of firearm, and I think they're really discriminating overall. He said, unfortunately, I don't see any difference in hunting with a semi-automatic versus a bolt action or a pump action or a single shot. The projectile still comes out at the end of the barrel at a high rate of speed. Attorney Barry Arrington who represented Nagger, says the AR-15 is not dangerous or unusual in the United States. It is not. Not at all. The fact of the matter is that it's a political grandstanding by the Connecticut legislator, and it has no effect on crime. Yes. Hood rats are not running around with ARs. Hood rats run around with handguns. Arrington told Inside Investigator in an interview, for obvious reasons, a criminal is not going to walk down the street with an AR-15. All these cases are done with handguns, which is preferred by the shooters, even during mass shootings. Yes, one of the mass shootings in our country was with a handgun, and that was in Virginia at the college. AR-15 is the most common rifle in the United States. Hey, I said that. According to a report from the National Institute of Justice, over 75% of mass shootings involve handguns. Only 25% have uh, involved assault rifles. I guarantee it's not an assault rifle. An assault rifle is something in the military... That is a thing, and has selective fire, which means you can go from safe to semi-automatic to either a three-round burst or full auto. My guy, you have not been able to own that since 1986. All right? That, that is not it. it. An assault weapon is a made-up term, and nobody knows what the hell it is. They are using the modern, modern sporting rifle, is what they like to term, but AR-15. Okay, 25%, but that's because it's so popular. However, 3% of all gun deaths involving rifles of any kind, according to Pew Research Center. Uh, The most popular rifle in America is not protected by the Constitution, and no rifle is, according to Arrington. He said that in the court. So that's the article. I just read the whole article to you, gave you my commentary on it. It'll be linked 
below. All right. So you can see how the state manipulates things. Manipulate the vocabulary. Okay, now the election is coming up. It's uh, about 12, 13 days out, November 5th. Okay, it is like literally the end of October and it is quickly approaching. I know many of you, should be all of you, but many of you are going to go vote because I mean, right now, unless you already have, because October 21st opened early voting in the state of Connecticut. So October 21st to November 5th, November 5th being election day. It is going to be a wild ride. This election is going to dictate the future of our country. And I think with the passage of um, the DOD Directive um, 5420.01, which we talked about in the last video, it doesn't really matter who wins. I think it's going to be an absolute shit show either way. You better be prepared. All right? It's going to be chaos. That being said, when you get in there to vote, most people are just going to vote down ticket. I've um, never been a fan of voting down ticket, and you should be doing your due diligence and who you vote for. All right? A lot of people will pick their candidates based on some criteria that they prefer. Right? They might not agree with everything that candidate uh, has said or done. However, there are a few things they agree with, and that's what they're voting for. Okay? I've always admitted, I, when I was active duty and I, always, and I voted, when it came to voting for certain individuals, uh, anytime Joe Lieberman ran, I pretty much voted for him. Um, especially after he got kicked out of the Democratic Party and became an independent. Not because I agree with pretty much anything that Lieberman uh, stood for or believed in. But the way I saw it was he was a straight shooter. I knew what I was getting, and he was fairly honest. And the fact that the Democrats in Connecticut threw his ass out was good enough for me. All right. So, did you know the CCDL actually has a grading structure for these upcoming elections? And they give you a list of the candidates, and they tell you how they stand on the Second Amendment. Now, for me, how they vote on the Second Amendment is that rather important because they pass all these restrictive gun laws. Okay. Now, you can't just be like, ah. That's easy. That's just the ones with the D's by their name. No, no, because when they passed HB Satan 7, some Republicans voted for that. All right, I will provide the link for this down below, but it's part of the CCDL uh, job. They look at candidates, they talk with the candidates, because some of the candidates come to the meetings, and then they give them a grade. All right, and we're just going to go through a few of them. Okay, um, the grading structure is pro 2 way. Uh, unreliable on the Second Amendment, or anti-2A, or unknown. Okay, so for U.S. Senate, we have Matt Corey and Robert Hyde. Both are rated pro-2A. Now, I know Robert Hyde personally. He's a Marine. He's good for the country. And we need to have him, or Matt Corey. I'll take either one of them. They need to be in the Senate. We need to get rid of Blumenthal and Chris Murphy. I also know Chris Murphy personally. And we're not going to get into what I want to say because I'm not, I don't like them. All right. Also in the election is Congressional District 2. Mike France is the candidate. And he is rated endorsed. All right. He's endorsed by CCDL. Now, Connecticut Senate, District 2 and 3. You have double. Douglas McCory, anti 2A. Saud Anwar, anti 2A. Matt Siracusa, pro 2A. Stephen King, not the author, but he's pro 2A. Um, MD Rahman, anti 2A. Derek Slap, anti 2A. Kyle Zimmerman is pro 2A. That's for um, Connecticut Senate seats. Okay. Um, Rick Lopez is anti 2A. George Austin is pro. John Kissel and Lisa Seminara are both endorsed by the CCDL. 
Matthew Lesser, anti 2A. Uh, Nyrell Moore. He's not anti 2A, he's not pro, but he's listed as unreliable. Gary Winfield, Winfield, anti 2A. Martin Looney, anti 2A. Christian Cohen, anti 2A. Elaine. Cariati, Pro 2A. I'm sure I slaughtered the piss out of it. John Huckadell, Anti 2A. James Maroney, Anti 2A. Joan Hartley, Anti 2A. Rod, Ron, Rob Sampson is endorsed by the CCDL. George Cabrera, Ca, yeah, Cabrera, Anti 2A. Heather Summers is Pro 2A. Catherine. Austin. Austin is in the middle. Unreliable. Uh, there's a lot in here. I'm not going to go through all of them. All right, but it lists all the ones. So, Connecticut House, it lists pretty much, they're all anti two way except for Manju Gerber. They're either, um, Francis Cooley is endorsed by the CCDL. All right, so everyone in Southington, um, if Cooley's on the ticket, vote for Cooley. I know Cooley. I've known Cooley for years. Uh, he's a good guy. He's smart. Um, he has obviously grown over the years. I think I might have had a little to do with that when it comes to the Second Amendment. Uh, but Cooley, Cooley's a good guy. I, I definitely endorse him. And that doesn't mean squat to you. So, but I like Cooley. All right? Um... So if you're in Southington and he's on the ballot for you guys, you really should vote for Cooley. Put him back in office. Uh, let's see. Scrolling through. It's a long list, guys. That's why I'm just going to put the link there because I'm not going to read everybody. Um, that's pretty much it. A lot of it's local stuff because that's what really affects us. Um, obviously, when Mont's not on the ticket this time, I have no idea how he got reelected. I mean, I do. New Haven, Hartford, Bridgeport, places like that outnumber all of us. So, so I was getting a little perks there. But I will put a link for this in the description below. Otherwise, we'd be here for quite a long time. Do your due diligence, guys. Local elections are where it's at. Everyone gets uh, all worked up about presidential and Senate seats and Congress and local. It's always been local. That's that's what affects us, okay? And I know Connecticut is deep blue and you kind of feel black-filled about it, but guess what? Get out and vote. You know, I'm, it always amazes me how many gun owners, um, hunters, and conservatives in general, just don't go vote. It boggles my mind, right? Just go vote, man. It, it takes five minutes. I just don't understand it. Okay. Get out and vote, guys. Just go vote, all right? It, do it. It's that simple. I'm going to go vote on that day. I've got other things to do, but I'm going to get up early and make sure I go vote. Okay. Now, the other thing you might not have seen, uh, and this will be real quick, but this kind of shows the state of our economy as a whole, as a country. Winchester Ammunition and Browning had put out a letter October 9th of this year. It says to all Winchester Ammunition customers. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. Thank you for your commitment to Winchester and Browning Ammunition in support of our legendary products. Due to continuing increased cost of input for manufacturing ammunition, it is necessary to increase ammunition prices for all our shipments, including back orders, beginning January 1st, 2025. Ammunition will be subject to an increase listed below. All ammunition products are going to go up between 5 to 10%. So on January 1st, 2025, this increase will affect all pack sizes, sub-brands, and special markups. 
or special makeups, sorry. All existing orders and future orders shipped on or after January 1st will be shipped at the new prices unless you notify us requesting a cancellation. The new price list will be issued in December. Sincerely, Winchester. So, ammo is going up. And I guarantee you, not only Winchester, but Federal and all these other manufacturers are going to follow suit and hike it up because, well, it's getting expensive. So, go out, get your stuff now before you get priced out, before you get sticker shock. Especially, you've got two weeks before the country basically has a good chance of just imploding. Um, buy it now. Stock up now. Obviously, I get nothing out of it. But you really, really need to make sure you get yours now. Um, when I teach classes, I always ask people, hey, what's a good number, um, a bare minimum of ammunition you might want to have at home per gun? Per caliber and you know some people are like well a box maybe two boxes and I'm like no 1,000 rounds per gun per caliber so if you have one nine millimeter handgun a thousand rounds of nine millimeter Luger if you have two nine millimeter handguns like say two Glocks then you're gonna need 2,000 rounds of nine millimeter okay and that is your bare minimum that is a stockpile that you have at home for you know when everything falls apart sometimes it rains what have you. Get your stuff now before it's really, really expensive. We already know that prices are outrageous. I mean, you go to the grocery store and you buy five or six items and you're already at $100. It's insane. Ammunition is going that route now. Get your stuff now. All right, I beat that dead horse enough. And, <clears throat> excuse me, getting back to the DOD directive. Um, Obviously, you guys know about it because I brought it to your attention. I'm sure you've seen it on a few other channels. But I was amazed at how many people had no idea. Uh, last Sunday, when I was teaching class, I had brought it up uh, right before the break because we were talking and a few things came up and it was like, oh, it's a good place to actually talk about it. And um, I had mentioned it and everybody just kind of stared at me. They're like, what? What's a DOD directive? So I kind of went over what a DOD directive is. And I said, this is what it says in a nutshell. And I had a copy of it with me. So I read it to them. And they just stared at me for a second, like, dumbfounded. Like, you could hear a pin drop. And they're like, how is that possible? That you can't, They can't do that. I was like, oh, but they did it. Oh, but they did they're getting ready for something. You might want to get ready too. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, I'm pretty sure it's not good for us, the citizenry. Um, talked about it on Saturday, the day prior, and uh, in class, so one of the dudes, one of the students was uh, a veteran. He was actually a team guy. And uh, we were talking about it, and I brought up the DOD directive uh, just so they knew about it, and he just was like, what? I was like, yeah. he goes, what about Posse Comitata? I was like, they just pretty much did away with that. I, I don't know, man. And he's like, that's, that's bad. So, I buckle up, guys. It's going to be a wild ride. If anything changes, I'll keep you guys surprised, but that's pretty much all I have for this video. Just wanted to give you guys an update on the oral arguments for Grant v. Lamont and, of course, a few other lawsuits that are going on with Connecticut in general. Of course, the grading system for who to vote for. You vote for who you feel is best for the state of Connecticut and our country. Just get out and vote. That's all I care about. All right? You don't have to vote for the same people I do. That, that would be boring. You vote for who you think is best for our country and our state. All right, if more people did that, maybe things would get turned around. And of course, ammo prices are going up, so get them now. I think I'm going to go get some right now. All right, I'll talk to you guys later. I will see all of you in the next video.